Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Personal Record Podcast, the podcast that examines why runners run. Today, I am joined by Liam McCabe. Liam is somebody that I've known really since childhood. Uh, he is known for a lot of things, but I think most famously in the Clark family, he is known for breaking our basketball hoop circa 1992 or so. <laughs> He uh he decided he could dunk and uh hung a little bit too long from a wooden wooden basketball hoop uh and and took it down. Uh I don't think my mother has yet gotten over that, but uh we won't hold that against him in today's interview. He's uh he's cracking up right now cuz I spoke to him before and I didn't tell him I was going to drop that on him right <laughs> right in the outset. <laughs> you remember uh, that, huh? <laughs> it's we still talk about it every Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh most recently, uh, Liam actually ran for city council in the 43rd district of Brooklyn, uh, which encompasses Bay Ridge, Bensonhurst, uh, and Gravesend, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he unfortunately was not successful in that endeavor, but uh, if Liam is known for one thing, it is for his resilience. And I guarantee you, he will be back out there one day running for something else. Uh, most importantly, for our purposes today, Liam is the race director and the founder of the Willie McKay Memorial Run which is a run for that raises awareness and raises money for homeless veterans in Alice Head Park. It's actually named after his father, uh, who was a homeless veteran. So that uh, is a cause very near and dear to his heart. Uh, so we're going to get into all these things. But uh, first, let's say hello. Liam, thanks for joining us. Hey. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Tim. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, so yeah. first, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the Willie McCabe run? Can you tell us uh, what's what's... Well, who is it benefiting? Uh, why are you doing it? And uh, what is where can we find our information on it? Sure. Well, it is uh, it's to benefit homeless veterans um, for the most part, you know. And sometimes the proceeds will go to organizations that may just help the homeless, or in some cases, may just help veterans. But we try to find organizations that um, that help both. Um, so that's what it what it is designed to do. That's that's where the proceeds go. Um, it's named after my father, Willie McCabe. He was unfortunately a homeless veteran uh, who lived in and around Bay Ridge, uh, was where I grew up and uh, where uh, he spent a lot of time. You know, prior to him uh, falling into homelessness, and um, and then during the time he was homeless, he definitely spent a lot of time in and around uh, that park, and it actually. Um, a few blocks away, underneath the, the Bay Ridge Towers, um, in that in that area, what we used to call the ditch as kids, the uh, the 65th Street Rail Yard was where he spent a lot of time and sort of set up camp. So it's very close to that area. Um, the park has a lot of meaning. That whole area in Bay Ridge, sort of my you know part of town, your part of town, um, what you might call Northern Bay Ridge, was very uh, also important to my dad. So I. There, there weren't that many races that really happened in and around Owls Head Park. Originally, I'd wanted to do something along Leif Erickson, which was where he spent some time or, you know, somewhere down by the train tracks. But of course, you, you can't hold a race down there. But um, there weren't really or, or any road races through Owls Head Park. And it's really a great uh, hilly park in our community. Most of the races are road races or along the bike path, which is which is nice. You know, you probably can get a great uh, time it's flat, but it's also boring, you know. And I have a, a background in cross country, so I love, I love, um, you know, running through the woods and run through hills. And um, Owls Head just seemed like a great, a great fit. And we were able to get a permit a few years ago. We started the cable run, and now we do it every year for the most part in the fall. That's great. Um, yeah, you were the you were quite a runner back in high school. You were. <clears throat> Excuse me. You were the uh, Brooklyn Queens champ in 1996, 1997, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's your- I was the Brooklyn Queens champ for the steeplechase. Um, I was a cross country runner and um, a mid distance runner, really. You know, between the 800 and the mile, the 800 was probably the race I focused on. I, I ran for Bishop Ford Catholic uh, Central Catholic High School in Park Slope. It was no longer there, but we. Um, we were a pretty good team, you know, rivals to a lot of the other Catholic schools in Brooklyn and certainly in this city. We had won our fair share of some city championships uh, in cross country, and we we we, um, we won some Brooklyn cross country championships when I was there. And I was able to run the steeplechase one year and win it. Um, wasn't the fastest time; it was around ten minutes and change, I think. A, a, and I 
don't know off the top of my head, but I think a better time was it, it had you had broken 10. Somewhere around 9 or 8 and change would have been really – would have been a much better time. So it wasn't the, it wasn't the best time, but but it was an, it was enough to win. So that was kind of fun. And um, I ran cross country, and then uh, I was able to also get a scholarship to St. Francis College. So I ran for a little bit for a few years in St. Francis College, and then you know I left to pursue work and politics and other things. But uh, yeah, yeah. You one of the things that in politics that you did was uh, you started the a political consulting and marketing firm, actually called mm -hmm. Steeplechase Strategies. So I think somewhere deep down you always you've always identified as a runner. I have, I have. You know, I, I it's it's funny. I um I always have identified as a runner. I love running. I haven't <laughs> I've been doing it in many years. Even though I organize this race every year and uh, put it on and have a lot of fun. I know the runners that that run and participate in it really love it because it's 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 really kind of taken on its own um its own brand. It's like the Owl's Head Park race, and uh, it's a fun race for those um, for people that don't know about Owl's Head Park. It's a it's a it's a very hilly. It's a small park, but it's a very right. hilly park. So that's not right. a uh, it's it's the park Dead where Man's everyone Hill, right? we, have, we have Dead Man's Dead Hill. Dead Man's Hill. That that's right. It's the park where uh, on days like today when it's snowing, uh, it's we're 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 film we're uh, recording this in early January right now with a, in the midst of a snowstorm. Uh, right. But it's it's the park where all the kids go to go sledding. So if you can imagine. Right running a race in a park like that. That's, that's where this race is, which I don't, I don't right. mean to dissuade anybody from doing it. Cause it's a ton of fun. I know, I know, uh, Liam knows how to throw a party. So, uh, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely, it's definitely worth <laughs> You're just doing. trying to get me in trouble, right? <laughs> what, uh, now how do people find out about the race? What, where do they go? How can they donate? How can they participate? Sure. We have a, we have a website, Willie McCabe I'll put oh, that. I'm the, sorry. I'll put that I, in I the show notes. Uh, let me, let me take that back. The Facebook is Willie McCabe Run. The website is just McCabeRun.com. Okay. All right, so yeah, you we'll, can find we'll, us on Facebook. We'll put that in the show notes so uh, people can uh, can click on that. Um, yeah. All right. So why why Steeplechase Strategies? Why did you uh, why'd you decide to name it that? Um, you know, it's it was a I, I had started work as a um, I guess what you might call a political operative, somebody who just started volunteering on campaigns locally. Uh, I took an interest in politics. Uh, my father was a pretty hardcore Irish Catholic Union Democrat, right, and a Mets fan, right. I mean, not necessarily all in that order, but that's that was his identity, and he loved politics and he loved talking about politics and uh, everything from national politics. We would watch at the time, you know, it was in high school. Bill Clinton was uh, debating George uh, George Bush Senior, uh, you know. Uh, on TV for the presidency. We got caught up in that. We, we, we talked about local stuff and he was very heavily involved. So I got very involved in politics, just, just in taking interest in it. And, um, you know, in college, a little bit after college, I started getting involved volunteering on campaigns and that led to getting work on campaigns and then working for some elected officials. So I developed some skills and some knowledge in, in, in that, um, in that world of what you might call consulting and decided to start uh, a, a corporation start a company and make it a legitimate business and, and try to to um, earn a living and um, and do some of the stuff I love which is working on campaigns and I I thought of some names and you know one of the things that came to mind was steeplechase for a lot of reasons I, I had run the steeplechase and also I think it has meaning in the sense that uh, you know politics they call them races they call campaigns races and really what we were doing was working on races um, and the steeplechase also is um, analogous to politics in the sense that it's about all of these obstacles that you have to overcome and finish first. And that's really sort of the nature of almost every campaign, right? There's going to be obstacles. You have to run the race and finish first. And that's that's the name of the game. So it, it seemed like a cool fit. And, uh, it, you know, I looked around. There really was, you know, no one had taken it. And um it had a nice ring to it, so that's that's how steeplechase strategies. Came I like about. that. That's that's a good uh, that's a good story. Uh, yeah. So for anyone that knows me and knows Liam, I think would uh, would would I think they would agree that you and I don't necessarily agree on most things politically. Except that's probably not even entirely true. I just think so. Me and Liam have gotten into our fair share of uh, debates over the years, uh, but regardless of all that, one of the things that I've always actually respected about you, Liam, was you've you've known you've wanted to go into politics uh, probably since high school i'd say uh it's mm -hmm. been something that you've just kind of 
really wanted to do your entire life. And it's something that you've kind of pursued endlessly. Uh, it's something I've always really respected. On top of which, you've just been a like a community organizer uh, for as long as I've known you, really. Uh, mm -hmm. You take on any sort of projects. You're at all of the, you know, Third Avenue Merchant meetings. You're at all the community board meetings. You're really heavily involved in trying to get things done and trying to make your, you know, Bay Ridge community better. Uh, which mm -hmm. again, I think anyone can agree with. I don't care what your what your politics are. Anyone can agree that some if someone's willing to work to make the place they live a better place, then that's somebody that you should work with, regardless of uh, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. Uh, and that's something I've always really respected about you. I appreciate. Thank you very much. I appreciate no, that's, that. I, I mean no. that. That's uh, that's something I've always I've always said that. Me and me and Pat Dillon uh, have always yes. had. We've always had that conversation. I, you know, whenever right. whenever whenever you'd appear in the newspaper talking about whatever whatever the latest. Uh, uh, issue was, you know, you were always sure. like in the paper, you know, forefront. Uh, and we always, we always, the two of us always talked about how much we respected that. Uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that I thought was interesting about you was when you ran for city council, uh, mm -hmm. again, just kind of as a testament to your, uh, just, just to your character, you, you, you were working for Dan Donovan, right? Mm -hmm. So Dan yep. Donovan was the congressman of the, uh, what, what district was he again? It would be the 11th congressional. The 11th, right, that's what right. Covers all of Staten Island, um, the entire borough, and it covers uh, the south uh, west portion of Brooklyn. Okay, so you actually left what is a great job in order mm -hmm. to pursue, again, like a lifelong sort of dream. You wanted to start becoming a, uh, you wanted to run for office yourself. Uh, you actually quit again, a good job, good paying job, uh, to then fund your own campaign, uh, largely I'd say, uh, and in so do it. So because you had quit your job, you needed another job. So you actually became an Uber driver. So you were, yeah. I, which I was, again, another thing that I just respected, you were this working class candidate. You, you didn't just, you know, continue whatever job you had, you know, especially there might've been a conflict of interest working with, uh, Dan Donovan. Uh, mm -hmm. you quit that job and went and became an Uber driver to fund your campaign to run for city council. Something that I don't think a lot of people appreciate enough. Yeah. Well, so that's, that's, that's absolutely correct. I, uh, I knew for a while that I wanted to run and I had spoken to the congressman. I had spoken to some of the people, um, you know, I spoke to my family and, uh, I, uh, I, realized I would need to make a living. I wanted to separate from the congressional office um, because, as you said, I thought it might be a conflict of interest. You know, I also wanted to make sure that I had some independence. One of the issues I had with some of the people, uh, or for that matter myself, if I were to continue running uh, for office while working for another elected official, you know, could I genuinely uh, criticize that that person? And the answer is no, right? You, you And you didn't find much criticism, and I won't name names, but so, ma many of the other people I ran against, some of the top tier, you might say, candidates really didn't have the guts, I think, to just quit, quit and figure out something, you know, and take a pay cut or do something. Yeah, they were like hedging and, their bets. Know, yeah, right, hedging their bets. And, you know, I think this neighborhood is great because you can, it has a sort of independent voice, right? It's a place we talk about politics. You know, my father's a big Democrat. I'm a Republican. But it's a great neighborhood in that it, it really is a, a sort of a 50-50 neighborhood at times. Uh, this is a neighborhood where the elections actually happen in November. A lot of people in New York City joke that most elections take place in September. And what they mean by that is whoever wins the Democratic Party, for the most part, for Congress, city council, state senate, assembly, mayor of New York, uh, whatever the case may be, whatever office, for the most part, it's really whoever becomes the Democratic nominee. There really isn't a two-party system, right? And that's not democracy. So at least in our little corner of New York City, in Bay Ridge, we have a, a vibrant two-party system. Um, so that, that, that I thought was important. Separate from the congressman's office, look, I, I, it's not that I had major disagreements, but if I wanted to articulate um, something, I was able to. Uh, and I also thought it was um, it was important to uh, to uh, you know sort of put your money where your mouth is, right, and just 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 go for it, you know. Exactly, and it just and again just uh, just just from a, on a character level, you know, willing to go out and work, you know, a tough job like driving a cab isn't isn't an easy job. It's late hours, right. it's long days, you know. Uh, and that's, that's, that's not easy. Uh, you know, and I, I just, I'll say, you know, the other part about it is you, 
you've always got to remember who you're working for, right? And, uh, you know, part of it, people said, well, what are you doing? Maybe I could have stayed on longer. I could have done something else or I could have taken uh, another line of work. But a lot of my friends actually had become Uber drivers or did it on the side to make some extra money. And they sort of recruited me in. And, um, you know, I said, wow, this is not too hard. Let me get a TLC license. I had to go through a few steps. I had to get a car. I rented a car originally. And, um, but look, it is a working class job and this is a working class neighborhood. And, you know, it, 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 it definitely brings you, um, closer to, to the core values of what you're, why you're running and why you're trying to do this, what you're, what you're running for and who you're running to represent. That's exactly, it's one of the things that I think, you know, you and I both, one of, one of the, one of the lessons that I think is kind of beat into you early, uh, growing up in that kind of environment is like, there's no job that you're too good for. You know, there's, right. there's, I don't, I don't care if you're scrubbing toilets. If you, if you think you're too good to scrub a toilet, then I don't know, man, get out of everyone's way. Cause that's, you're right. just, you're, you're not helping anybody. You're not doing any good. Right. You know what? I, I'll say this since, you're, since we're talking about it. When I worked, I was in between, uh, jobs, uh, working for another elected official at one point, And I had my company that, that bring in some revenue. I took a job just for a season waitering and I had waited back in college and I worked for uh, uh, catering halls and I you know some people sort of beat me up about it and said you know oh you know you you know you, you want to run for office you're, you're working as a waiter I said look man that's exactly why I'm running I'm running because I, I represent waiters I, I am you know I've been a waiter um, I'm representing waiters I'm, I'm representing uh, blue collar people I'm representing the working class and that's really why I got into this so it, it was bizarre I, I would say too because as a Republican, you know, I was getting attacked from the, let's say, the far left on some cases. Just, I think because they, they didn't they didn't like me or they didn't want me to win for whatever reason. But uh, I was actually getting attacked on being an Uber driver or right? having been a waiter or, or sort of like trying to um, – even today, I actually criticized our current city councilman. You know, some of the snow wasn't shoveled up as quickly. And, you know, I find it now it's my job as citizens, Citizen McCabe to – Sort of, uh, you know, give the man. Always taking on an issue. That's <laughs> so I was uh, sort of publicly uh, chastising the current councilman, uh, one of the candidates who the, who ran and won on the Democratic side. Um, and, you know, everybody's all of sort of uh, this guy's sink offense, right? And these are uh, supposed liberal people, you know, sort of taking jabs at you're an Uber driver or you were this, you were that, like. There's nothing I'm ashamed of, and it's sort of bizarre that people would attack on those lines, given that you're coming sort of from the left. And you know, I don't want to go any. I don't want to turn this into a political thing. But <laughs> I just find that interesting. That you know, and maybe it's a maybe it's it has something to do with what's going on. I think nationally with with political parties, um, where the Republican Party, where the Democratic Party are going. You know, as I said, my father was a hardcore union blue collar Democrat, and um, I don't know. Things are changing a little bit. I I definitely think that. The Republican Party, in many ways, has an opportunity to sort of get in, get in there, and and try to represent and um, um, fight for, for for the middle class a little bit better. Let's see if they do. So. There are def- there's definitely uh, an interesting political tide that's happening in the country right now. Uh, who's right. going to come out on top? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I was I don't I don't, know. I don't want to get into it either, but I don't know. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I think I think the Republican <laughs> Party has uh, has a few kinks they need to work out, and honestly, I think they will work them sure. out. So. Right. You know, I, I think See, I think, we're turning this into a political vibe. I know. It's, it, it, it's, it's like it's it's like being back in the bar in Bay Ridge all of a sudden. It's you and <laughs> me going at it again. I'll tell you what right. I think about this. Actually, I will take I will take uh, I will take what you kind of just said and bring it back to running a little bit. Right. Uh, what do you think it is? Because I think there's kind of a connection, uh, maybe not 100 percent behind this working class upbringing and an ability to perform well at endurance sports, you know, whether it's running or triathlon or cycling, I feel like you see a lot of people do really well that come from these working class environments. And I I think there's a connection between uh, that, again, just like do any job, do what it takes, you know, there's there's no such thing as a uh, as a job you're too good for, because at the end of the day, running and and triathlon and whatever else, it's not it's not glamorous, like the day to day uh, training that you have to undergo is not glamorous. You know, wh- what would you, would you say there's a connection? Would you say there's something about your working class upbringing that, that, that pointed you toward running? You know, sure. Absolutely. 100%. So it's funny you say that, you know, when you grow up working class, let's just say you grow up in the neighborhood and 
you, you, you definitely grow up following sports or interested. Maybe you play sports. You play basketball or baseball. I, I actually was able to run a little bit in at our, our Lady of Angels. I had a track team. But it's certainly never the most popular sport. Most families really aren't that into running or sort of track and field. You know, they watch the Olympics. But the real sports, right, watched – in homes all across, you know, our city and all across the country and, and, you know, definitely in our neighborhood, you know, it's baseball, it's Mets, Yankees, Giants, Jets, it's hockey. Um, and you go to high school, you get into school and, and those are the sort of the, the uh, sports you might be interested in and you give a shot at basketball and you get cut from the team, you go, you know, and, you, and you, 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 you grow up at least thinking there are the haves and the have nots, there's talent. And there's those without talent, right? And if you can't throw a 90-mile-an-hour fastball or you can't hit, you know, a three-pointer, you know, or dunk the ball <laughs> unless unless you take the, the hoop down in, in, in the parks back here. <laughs> That's right, right yeah. But uh, as, as you know, I can't dunk a basketball. From you jumped from the fence. You know, that's right. <laughs> well, that might have that done it. But uh, <laughs> if you don't have talent, maybe, you know, you sort of kind of grow up in that – in that in – that, in that in that uh, uh, prism, looking at sports that way, and I, when I when you finally start to learn about running, and you realize that you can put so much into it, and and really become better, right? It's really what you put into it with running, unlike some other sports. And that's what I had a great coach, Lou Vasquez, um, a who's famous, a coach, a famous local famous. Uh, local runner. Man, he's uh, no, that guy's a great, legend. A great guy, a great a great um, a great mentor, a great coach. Uh, just a, a great guy all around, still a friend and still in, involved in running. You know, he went I have from to get him on the podcast. I have, to, I have to talk to him at some point. He's yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll reach out to him. I don't know if you're yeah, on Facebook. Uh, I'll reach out. I, I don't uh, know. Lou, I've only met him a couple times. I don't know him super well. If you could do that, that'd be great. That's uh, sure, he'd, sure. He'd be a great you know, guy he to went, talk to. He, he, went know, he knows where Bishop he Ford. he knows where all the bodies are buried. He's been he's been oh he's yeah, been doing this for yeah. for decades. God, he from from the time he was in high school running for Severian and then, you know, became the coach for maybe 20 years. Bishop Ford went to the armory, ran the armory, uh, Icon Stadium, um, involved in everything with running, New York Road Runners, you know, the, everything. Just a, just a, And I had the I had the luxury and the benefit and the privilege of having him as my high school track coach. So he imparted all that wisdom. And, you know, another working class guy who made it big in the world of running, through running. And through that sort of philosophy. So, you know, a, a lot of that he imparted on us. And, you know, he took a bunch of kids who might not otherwise have ever dreamed of being track superstars or getting scholarships or didn't even know that scholarships have, uh, were available to anybody outside of guys that played basketball and football and baseball. And, um, it, you know, really, I, I guess, ingrained in us and um, taught us that you can, you, can, you can really do whatever you want with, with running. And it really is what you put into it. And that's one of the things that, that he would say, look, you can have a guy who's just a nat – look, there are naturally talented runners without a doubt. But more often than not, it's the guys and the girls who will put in the hard work that will reap the benefits. And that, again, I guess goes back to our to our, our sort of our, our blue-collar, hardworking you know, roots. It's – it's ingrained in us so that we end up coming out on top because we work really hard at, at, at everything. And it's um, it's just interesting, I think, for young kids to realize, wow, you know, I'm, I'm not the greatest. Um, I don't have the greatest talent with some of the other sports that to a degree, no matter how hard you try, if you can't dunk a basketball, you, you almost can't dunk a basketball. Right. There are certain things that that there are limitations. But with running, unlike a lot of other sports, like you said, or endurance sports, if you just work your ass off, you will get better and you will be the best. And heart and determination are the real factors. Yeah, I, that's very well said. Uh, that's something actually it's it's you kind of already answered it, but it's it's a question that I ask a lot of people on this podcast is what do you think is more important, uh, work or talent, like hard work or talent? Uh, and I, I guess, I, you know, for you, I guess the answer is in endurance sports, hard work. You know, whereas kind of like you in, said, you know, in life, it's, exactly in life, you know, I, right. I've always looked at, uh, at, at, at running and, and for me, triathlon, you know, as like an allegory for life, you know, it, it's it, every situation is a metaphor. Every situation you come across in running is a metaphor for your life. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you can apply that to some situation, you know, you know, having a tough day at work or how, you know, th this is just, I'm having a bad moment during this run. That's my bad moment at work. Are you having a bad year? This is, a, you know, I'm just... 
in a building year, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, I think you, you answered that very, very eloquently. So a long time ago, you told me a story. Again, this is another non-running related question. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to tie this into running some point somehow. But uh, you told me a story about how you met Bill Clinton. Mm-hmm. Can you can you tell me that story now? Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, this was right after he was um, he was president. I think he had written his book. <laughs> You're getting me in trouble here, but uh, he he had written his book and uh, he had a um, he had a book signing. I think it was Borders' book, and at the time it was downtown Manhattan, somewhere along Broadway, close to Wall Street. I'm, I'm, I remember, and um, I guess Bush was president. Clinton had written his book, and it was a big my life. It was big. Um, it was a big deal. Everyone to you know meet him. He get the book signed and. Um, uh, it was all over New York City. He was, he was at Borders. He was at uh, different bookstores getting it signed. And I was walking home one night from work late, um, probably walking to the uh, Whitehall Street station along Broadway. Down, sort of sometimes take a longer walk through downtown. Um, and everyone was lined up. There was a few people uh, lined up. And I was asking, oh, what are you, what are you doing? They're like, well, we're uh, – we're waiting here to get our book signed by the president. I said, oh, that's kind of cool. And uh, I said, jokingly, if I come back, you know, will you let me cut the line? You know, and they said, ah, ha, ha. <laughs> And I went, <laughs> I think I went back and talked to my dad that night. And he was like, oh, you got to get me, you got to get me the book signed. And, you know, gave me, gave me some money and said, if you're back in the city, you know, see so if you can get it signed from you, something like that. And I came back, but I had bought the book at, um, uh, and this was later on in the mi- the next day. So I had seen the, the people I had saw that night were waiting overnight, prepared to wait. And that was the beginning of the line. The next day I was, I guess I was, I think I was taking class at St. Francis. I believe I was downtown and there was a um, Barnes and Noble down there that I bought the book at and then took the train back over to downtown Manhattan from, from downtown Brooklyn. And uh, this is all important for the story too. So <laughs> pay attention. And uh, now at this point, this is the, – the president's been there. The foreign president's been there. He's been probably signing books for a few hours toward the end of the day now. I had seen these people. They're, they're long gone, right? Obviously, there's no cutting the line. And I said, well, you know, let me get to the back of the line. And the the, uh, the there was no back of the line. That's it. It was closed off. Um, there was what they were calling a Hail Mary sort of section. That You know, if, if there was any room left, you know, they'd let this group of people um, back onto the line. So, you know, I noticed that everyone in line had a, like an orange wristband. <laughs> so, uh, I went to, uh, I went to the uh, Staples across the street. <laughs> I got some orange, uh, um, uh, uh, construction paper and I, you know, I sort of folded it to, to the, to what I thought was the, the story is actually better than I remember it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. <laughs> you're gonna get in trouble here, you know. And uh, all to get a friggin' book signed by Bill Clinton, right? But uh, you're gonna kill my Republican credentials here. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I it was for I your father. The, uh, I think I think everyone uh, understands. I put the uh, exactly. So I put the uh, the paper on my on my hand, you know, and it was the same color, but it was construction paper, not like glossy, you know. <laughs> and um, and uh, see, this I, is the uh, Liam I remember. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I see a kid who um, who I knew, who I who knew me from St. Francis College. So I was like, oh, I just get in. Okay. And in talking to him, uh, um, he like let me sort of slide in. Now he was coming out, but I kind of slid in right before you're about to go in. And, um, you know, this this line I cut was probably, you know, a, a whole city block long. And I just kind of <laughs> cut in. And in, you know, kind of talking to him in, in the kind of the commotion, I slide in and I also realize that uh, some somebody had gotten caught for doing similar to what I had been doing uh, or, or didn't have a, a wristband or, or maybe a completely fake wristband. Or, uh, and I, I said, you know, let me just go up and sort and this of would be like a Secret Service type of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. But here you go. You got me a, this isn't got just me like sneaking into the, uh, the happy hour. <laughs> right. So I kind of went right up and said, let me just take a shot and show them my construction paper. So, you know, if I'm going to go, let me just take my shot. And they, I guess the confidence I had sort of in like <laughs> jokingly around showing them my construction power, prob- construction paper, wristband, probably caused them to think, 
you know, n not look twice. And I got right in. That was it. I didn't have to wait in line. It was, I kind of walked in. And here's where the story gets interesting. I have to, you have to take everything off. You, now you talk about Secret Service, metal detectors. I had to take off my belt. I had a book bag. Everything, you have to leave it there. You go through. Um, and someone in line at Borders says, excuse me, sir, you're, that's a Barnes & Noble's book. How did you get in you know, like, there? And I like, kind of like growled at the guy, like, get the hell away from me. You know? <laughs> because you had to buy a book. See, part of the, what I didn't realize is you, you get the book and then you get the wristband, right? So it wasn't a Borders book, you know? He was on to me. But at that point, I was on the escalator. And I quickly <laughs> rip off the, the Barnes & Noble sticker, right? Or peel off the Barnes & Noble sticker, right? And I think I'm clean to clear now. Sure enough, I you get to the table and you, you slide the book uh, to, a, to a Secret Service agent. You kind of, they inform you. you know, they, they instruct you, open up the front page, the title page, push it to them. They slide along. There's the president shaking hands. He's a very charismatic guy, you know? And, He's shaking hands and uh, he's like, um, uh, how you doing? And I had a, I had an FDNY shirt on at the time. You know, I was just kind of like scruffy, going to classes. You know, I, I, everybody was really kind of dressed up to it's me. probably right after September 11th you know? too, right? That's right. That's right. And he kind of, maybe he thought I was a fire. So he really stood up and everybody was sort of getting like a general, like, how you doing? And he gave me one of the real, like, you know, reached in, grabbed my forearm kind of grips and, uh, you know, was like, you know, thank you very, you know, thank yeah. you very much. I said, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not a fireman, but I said, I would like to be a statesman. What do you, you know, something like, something along those lines. And he said, son, a statesman ain't nothing but a dead politician. You got to get elected. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's good advice. You know, I'm not having my moment with the president. We're kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're yucking it up. I got my book signed now and he personalized a little bit. You know, I got the books on. Now I turned to the agent because what they were doing was they were clipping your, they were clipping your band, so they couldn't <laughs> get it in. Now I turned to the agent and they take my paper, you know, my paper mache. You know, <laughs> here I am in front of the former leader of the free world, and you know, I just snuck in to get them. <laughs> so she says, "This, sir, this is a fake." Now, I I don't know what could be done to me. They certainly could have took the book away, or you know, but I'd gotten to that point, you know, and on. on, on, on Construction paper. So Bill Clinton's like, watch out for that guy. You know, like, <laughs> sort of like, good for you. You got, you got away with it. You know, and, <laughs> right. and, and then I guess that was sort of the signal, right, to the Secret Service. Let him go. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. He got, yeah. past, he got past the defenses. He got the book signed. And uh, the rest is history. But I always thought it was a, it was a cool story. Also <laughs> because story. Um, his appreciation for the for the fire department. I think he, he assumed I was a fireman, you know. Yeah. And uh, he had a lot of love. He kind of got up and gave me kind of gave me a hug, and you know, it was kind of it was kind of cool. It was kind of cool. Yeah, that's a that's a great story. You told me that story, and I think it's uh, I think it was better now than it was last time. But uh, yeah, just, that, that's and I, you know that's that's that probably happened to you when you were you were probably eighteen, nineteen years old, right? Somewhere around there. It was yeah, it was young, you know, young twenties. Around there. I mean, Democrat or not, I mean, that's that 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 one line he said to you probably had a big effect on uh, the trajectory of your life. Yeah, you know, de definitely it was definitely it was interesting because I don't think I had met. Um, I had been around some some elected officials at that point. I had probably been in the room with some people that had maybe have been the governor or higher, <laughs> but I don't think I'd I'd certainly had never met the president of the United States, Republican or Democrat. So to hear, sort of hear him just kind of, um, you know, just give you some real politic. Like, listen, cut the BS. Just get in there and just try to do something, you know, yeah. and, uh, make action. So speaking so of uh, cool. speaking of trying to do something, just one more, one more little Liam McCabe anecdote. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, just you're the kind of person uh, that I think is just great for this podcast. Meaning, you know. Predominantly, what we're talking about today isn't running, but I think the mm -hmm. spirit of the running that that you have is 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 kind of you've taken it into other aspects of your life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, leading up and the, the years leading up to you finally actually running for office, which again, I, I I'm I would bet any amount of money you're not done. Uh, mm -hmm. But there was a point where the R train was suddenly uh, disrupted in Bay Ridge. For for those that don't know, the R train is pivotal for people from Bay Ridge to get to and from work. Uh, and the R train was all of a sudden suspended. Uh, you actually got in your car and started driving people to and from the uh, Bay Ridge Avenue station to the 59th Street station where they can get the N train just because all right. these people needed to get to work. 
uh, right. which again is just a testament to who you are. You're a person that looks at a problem uh, and tries to fix it. I don't care what your what your what your politics are. I think uh, you 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 have to respect that. And that's right. uh, that's been that's the kind of person you've been. That's kind of the person I've always known you to be. Well, yeah, I mean, look, it just uh, I guess it sort of jumped out at me, right? I mean, I had just recently. Well, I had been an Uber driver for a little while, right? So I was in the, the, the sort of the, the beginning of the real campaign now. I'd be, I was a candidate and um, I was an Uber driver and that was all I was. You know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't working for the congressman anymore or, um, or any of elected officials. So I, I, I said, look, I've got this card. Let me just do something. It sort of just clicked. And then, and then it became like an interesting story. And, you know, it was also, I guess, an interesting contrast because here I was. I sort of drove down 69th Street. With some of my signs on the window and, you know, honking the horn and making noise and <laughs> pulling people into the car and it's sort of looking at me kind of strange. And some of my opponents had set up podiums, right? And they were here to give press conferences to bang their, you know, their fist and say, we need more uh, buses and this is not right. And I think the issue at the time was that they shut the R train down with really little – um you know, uh, information given to the neighborhood. So when people kind of were st stranded on a Monday morning, uh, you know, not knowing how to get to 59th Street. So our, the 69th Street trips station was closed and uh, there really were no buses running. There were no shuttle buses. There were just, um, there was the B9 that normally goes down to 59th and then hooks up like 69th, 60th Street and um, goes to like King's Plaza. So th there really wasn't any shuttle. And I thought, let me just start giving rides. What what the hell? And and you know what's interesting is that I achieved the same thing that some of the people were, were doing. Like I got attention, right? I mean, um, that that's also a part of it, right? I mean, I I, I, I you gotta be honest. Part of it is you want to draw attention uh, to the issue, but I did it by by also providing a service. So you know, I I, I tried to do that throughout the campaign, like take action. And sometimes and many times when you take action, you're also getting the attention or highlighting the problems or highlighting the issues that need to be fixed. So it, and it was a lot of fun and it was a great way not only to, you know, help my neighbors, but meet voters. You know, people are getting in the sure. car like, hey, you know, aren't you running? And, you know, it was weird because a lot of people didn't trust me or like, who the hell is this guy? And, you know, they would all of a sudden be like, who is he? And then one person would like leave the bus stop or like kind of standing around the train station, not knowing what to do. And like one person would get in and be like, you know, can I trust you? And then they like kind of recognize me a little bit. And they're like, all right. And then, then everybody would pile in. And I'd be like, that's it. That's it. I'll be back in five minutes. You know, it was kind of funny. I had to like push people away. Like it would, no one would do it. One person would sort of, uh, break through and, and yeah, decide one, to come yeah. in. You know? Yeah. One person had to be the leader to, uh, to get into the, uh, into the, right. Into right. The then every, everyone to come. That, that's something I, I had said uh, just a long time ago, just in some nonsense conversation I was having with somebody, that I don't understand why politi politicians don't do more of that. Why aren't they more aggressive in some sort of action? I, I always kind of said, like, holding a race, that'd be a great way to, you know, do several things. One, yeah, you get your name out there. Like, you know, you have to do it. It's, it's just the nature of the beast. Uh, but mm -hmm. two, while you're getting your name out, you're actually providing a service. I think you're right. I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of podium thumping uh, right. and not necessarily a lot of, hey, let's take this on. Let's, let's figure this out. You know, draw, right. drawing attention to something is great. Definitely has to be done, but uh, you could do both ways. I thought that was a very creative approach. Right. Thank you. Thank you. We did a lot of cool stuff. Unfortunately, I, I fell short, but I, I did have a lot of fun doing that stuff. And I definitely would have carried that um, that approach into government. You know, it was a lot of fun. One of the things we, we had a lot of fun with was we also took garbage, which wasn't getting picked up. It's probably still not getting picked up. On some of the terrace streets in Bay Ridge, as as you know, we have a lot of side streets, and um, um, I live uh, on a I grew up on a terrace street, Ridgecrest on a terrace. terrace, walkways, and different areas that it might might be hard for some of the trucks to get down, and some of the really narrow ones, maybe dead end streets. The um, the sanitation department would have to physically walk in in some cases, or bring a small truck, or just kind of walk down and grab some of it and drag it out in some cases. And in some of these blocks, they basically just stop doing it. Um, and we were frustrated. The whole community was frustrated. They've been doing it for 50 years the, the right way. And for whatever reason, um, they stopped doing it. We, we tried to bring attention to it. We weren't getting anywhere. So I brought the garbage from Bay Ridge to Gracie Mansion, to the mayor's house. And you know what? <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It drove home. The it also got us attention. You know what sure. I mean? It was, it was a way I remember to that. I remember, I remember seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. And the mayor didn't want it. His, <laughs> you know, yeah. He didn't want it on his uh, sidewalk any more than the people of Bay Ridge 
wanted it on there. So. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Liam, I have, I have one last question for you. Uh, again, just in doing a little bit of research on you uh, today, uh, I was thumbing through a bunch of you know Facebook pictures and a bunch of uh, like Google images and everything. And I, I have to know, where do you get your suits? <laughs> you have uh, an amazing collection of suits. You just you look you look very strapping. You look like a true politician. Uh, two places probably right. Um, one is the. Uh, the sail rack at Macy's, and that's the truth. <laughs> and you know what? I'll be honest. They look good on you. Yeah, Whatever you. works, works. Now is a good time to buy, right? Because uh, <laughs> after uh, they're all marked down and you go up to what I think it's like the fourth floor in the back. Of the, it's, I also um, – Brooks Brothers. I get some Brooks Brothers sure, suits okay. when I – you know, Sprinkling when, a couple uh, of the nice ones in there. I've got a few Bro- Brooks Brothers. I really do like that. And, and I have a good tailor. I think that's what it comes up to. That's, um, yeah, it's probably true. Uh, Local Bay Ridge guy, I'm assuming. Uh, Diker Heights, okay, uh, 13th right. Avenue, Eric Olds, Okay. off of 74th and 13th. He's a great local tailor, and that's what it really comes down to. So you can almost take any suit, and if it's cut right, you know, and look, we talk about running. I've, I've spent a few years off the track, so <laughs> I put on a little, a little weight, and it's uh, the, the tailoring has a lot to do. Sure, okay. sure. All right, Liam, thanks so much for this conversation. Uh, just one more time, uh, tell everyone how they can, uh, how they can participate uh, with the Willie McKay Memorial Run. Sure. Well, you can you can certainly follow me if you see uh, you know me on Facebook, Leah McCabe. It's it, a lot of stuff is connected to my Facebook page. We do have a our own Facebook page, Willie McCabe Run, right on Facebook, and our own website, which is just McCabeRun dot com. And uh, it's we're looking probably at November eighteenth uh, again next year, only because we we have leftover posters, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it works. If it works, it works. Uh, but it'll probably that's be something next we learned with Tremere Sports. Never put the date on it. If you right. don't put the date <laughs> on it, you can reuse it. You can reuse it, right? Just the place. It's going to be an outlet. But we, you know, what's interesting is what we did last year. This year, actually, was it was November 18th, and we put Saturday by mistake, and it turned out like November 18th was on whatever it was. The day was off. Um, so now the posters, if we hold it next year, it actually falls on the right day. Like November 18th falls on a on a Saturday as opposed to Sunday, whatever it might be. So the posters will be correct for next year. We've got about 400 posters left. So. Fair enough. Yeah, I spoke. So you with, can uh, find out, and uh, and I and I'll, I'll be putting posters all over Bay Ridge, and just kind of pay attention next fall. Um, I'm going to try and get into some of the um, some of the the the, the running Facebook pages, uh, the Road Runners. We're going to try and also make this um, it, as a po- it's kind of a little a little cult run right now. It's a lot of people that just love running it, but we want to really make it a much more professional run as we grow. So some of the, um, some of the different running groups have said they're going to, they're going to help us out with that. Yeah. Mike Casper and I, uh, my business partner at Tremera sports, uh, we're talking about how we, we need to, we need to step it up and just start helping out. You know, you're a good guy and it's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good cause. So we, we'd like to, uh, help out in some way. Good. You heard it here, folks. You got to hold it. That's right. It's official. It's official. (laughs) Uh, all right. Again, thanks for everything. We uh, appreciate your time. Uh, appreciate everything you do for the Bay Ridge, Diker Heights, Gravesend community. Uh, and just keep doing what you're doing because whatever you're doing, you're doing it right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Tim. All right, Liam. Thanks again. We'll talk to you. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. All the Willie McKay Memorial Run uh, links will be in the show notes. So you can click on that. Uh, I will also put a link to uh, just Liam McCabe's Facebook page if you want to figure out what's going on in his life. Because uh, again, he's an interesting character. <laughs> Uh, So again, this has been your latest episode of Personal Record. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next time.